Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri State Cadillac. On today's show, Dan Abrams of Athlete Logos joins us to talk Mets, Ghost Forks, and to help us share some good Mets Pod news. We also look at the week that was highlighted by talk of Buck Showalter's future with the team, Binghamton's playoff run down on the farm, and of course, our scoreboard predictions. As always, we close out the show answering your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri State Cadillac dealer today. And here's your reminder to subscribe to our show, of course, at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You could watch on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcast. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co-host, Joe DeMeo, and our friend, our special guest, Dan Abrams, otherwise, of course, known as Athlete Logos. We are psyched to have Dan on the show. Dan partnered with us to create the awesome Mets Pod Shea Stadium Neon Logo t-shirt, for which we did a previous giveaway and sent out some to our winners. Here's the news. We are going to give out... Some more of those in honor of Dan being here today. Stay tuned for details for how to win one in just a little bit. But first, of course, let's actually talk some Mets. Dan, are you rooting for wins? Are you rooting for the tank like Joe is over here every week, hoping the team can improve that draft slot? Where is your mindset right now with this team? Uh, you know, it's funny. When they first did it, I thought they were, I don't know if they are still close to uh, sixth uh, from the last, but I was like, hey, they're you know, falling. Maybe the Rafael Ortega, our Ruiz games, I was kind of like, all right, embrace the tank. Let's get the best pick we can get. But first of all, the, the prospects are already so much better as it is. And now the energy around the team seems like it's a little more exciting. You know, the young guys are playing. So I personally would rather them win and or at least have good individual performances where everyone's really excited for spring next year. Let's talk about the ghosts. And you know what? One, one second. That's ah, right. There we go. Yeah, there Love we go. Love to right. see it. All right, so let's talk about the ghost, the ghost fort logo that I have on my hat. And for those, I mean, if you're not watching on YouTube, you should. But if you uh, are, you see Dan has the same hat. So obviously the ghost force logo, the ghost fork logo, the hat, everything. Kodai Senga wearing this all the time on his post game. Tell us all about that. How did you get connected to Senga and and that relationship? How did that form? Yeah, so uh, when he first signed and I heard of the pitch when he was still in Japan before he came, I, I mean, that's like a graphic designer's dream that he has. A, it's not only a name for the pitch, but that it's a ghost. For, I mean, it was, it's tremendous. So I, the first thing I did was I made the neon version that's on the hat and I sent him a neon sign as soon as he got to Port St. Lucie. And he loved it because he hadn't he didn't see it when I tweeted it. He didn't like or follow me after that, but he got the sign. He immediately followed me. And then when I made shirts, I sent him that liked it then i then in hats then whatever i made i always sent him one and i'm very fortunate that he wears he must keep one at city field and every home game and the post game he always wears it which is so unbelievably kind of him because i'm sure that they would prefer if he wore a met hat and i'm sure he intentionally is putting on the ghost hat after the game and that's awesome yeah, Dan, I'll be honest with you. The first presser, and this was a long time ago, I saw him wearing one, the black one. I was like, yep, instant buy right away. It's awesome. It's a great logo, um, and it's really cool that Senga rocks that. So speaking of more of your stuff, any progress on getting Neon to City Field at some point? We are big fans. No, you know, when I first when I first tweeted it, I actually had gone to the game the night before, and I took pictures of that brick wall where I thought it would go, and I was like, ah. You know, I don't want to tweet at Steve Cohen. It seems like I'm thirsty. I'm asking. So I was debating doing it. I thought, you know what? I'll do it. I'll probably get 25, 50 retweets and, you know, maybe I'll get maybe I'll get lucky. And it got so many that day. I don't know, 500 retweets that I started to think, oh, wow, maybe this could happen. And then someone wrote an article in The New Yorker and I really started and I asked him, the, the guy who wrote it. And I said, do you think they could actually do this? And he's like, I don't know. You know, Cohen seems like he likes to make the fans happy. So I got my hopes up again. But it's been over a year. I, it kind of died down. I I don't uh, want to think my hopes that high anyway, because if it doesn't happen, it'll be upsetting. And I kind of think at some point he's going to want a brand new stadium of his own, just like Jerry Jones. I know City Field is kind of kind of new. 
So he may not even be able to, but I think at some point in his tenure, he's going to say, I want the best stadium in baseball, brand new, retractable roof, whatever it might be. And maybe at that point I'll get a chance. But if you had to ask me, I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm always hopeful. Can you spoil any cool stuff you're working on for the off season? And do you have uh, your David Stern's neon <laughs> whole, all set up and ready to go for uh, shortly after October 2nd or whenever he becomes officially a Met? Well, my thing with David Stern is I need to know what his plan is for Pete. Cause after that, then I can get on board or off board. <laughs> Cause uh, depending on what he plans to do, which I think when they wanted to hire Theo, Theo wanted to rebuild and get rid of everybody. So, I don't know. I really, I gotta, I gotta withhold on that. After you know, trades and things that happen down the road, and his five-year tenure, it'll be a different story. But if his first move is to say, "We got blown away by some organization we're trading Pete," it's gonna be very hard for me to be making any uh, uh, artwork for him. I'll say this, Dan: If the Mets sign Yoshinobu Yamamoto this offseason, your designs around his yo-yo curve pitch are going to be uh, must-see TV. We'll be waiting for that. But speaking of that, how do you feel about the future of this Mets team? I mean, you kind of hinted at it. It's up in the air with Pete Alonso. We're waiting to see what David Stearns actually does when he gets here. What? Where is your state of mind on the future of this franchise? Well, first of all, I just got to take a pause. Did you say he has a, it's called a yo-yo curve? It is the yo-yo curve. That is his oh, signature yeah. pitch. So we could have the ghost yeah. fork one night and the yo-yo curve the next oh, night. Oh, that is tremendous. There'll be yeah. someone with a yo-yo sign in the outfield. Yeah. On the I'm glad I got, we got to break this to you because I, I know if they get him, you're going to be cooking with the yo-yo curve designs. That is incredible. I did not know that. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm always an, I'm the optimistic. I'm the opposite of uh, Frank. I'm always they're going to win the World Series if they win three in a row. I'm just I feel like the future is obviously better now ever since the trades they made. You know, pitching is really the the thing. It's hard to, you know, they traded for all these top prospects and no pitchers. It's it's hard to get. So hopefully Vassil and the other guys who are down there are that good, or they can sign a Japanese player. But you know. Pitching is hard to find and really what separates teams. I know the Braves are just a juggernaut overall in all in all regards, but most teams that are young and up and coming that make noise in the playoffs got to have a couple of good pitchers. It can't just be Senga, so we'll see. All right, time to give away some T-shirts. Again, these are the awesome shirts that Dan designed with the Mets Pod logo done up in the Shea Stadium neon. If you haven't seen them yet, we post them on the last giveaway. We'll have them up again. They are awesome. You can't buy them. You can only win them here. Keep that in mind. You cannot buy these. This is the place to get them. And here's a fun but sad fact. They are so exclusive. Yes, Joe and I don't have them. I am not kidding. And if you don't believe me, Joe and I will start to complain about it maybe every podcast. Hell, depending how long this goes on, Joe. We have been promised. We were told get the winners get the giveaways first. So we're trying to be kind and making sure that the winners actually get their shirts first. Then we'll rep them. So let's give some away. Keep your eyes peeled on SMY's social media platforms and also, of course, athlete logos as well. The former bird known as Twitter tells me Dan will share these posts as well. The post will announce the giveaway to enter, repost the tweet or X. I hate that I have to say that. If you see the post on Facebook or Instagram, drop an Apple emoji in the post to enter. Again, repost on Twitter or drop the Apple emoji in response on Facebook or Instagram. It's that simple. That's it. Good luck. And listen, Dan, thank you so much, not only for joining us today and, and giving us some of your time, but giving us a lot of your time to work on these Mets pod shirts. They look amazing. We can't wait to rep them on the pod. We can't wait to see the winners rep them as well when the giveaway is done. Thanks so much. And of course, guys, if you don't know, he's Athlete Logos. Check out all his stuff at Athlete Logos. We will be hoping and waiting on that yo-yo curve stuff. Thanks, Dan. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Great stuff from Dan. Be sure to check out his stuff at Athlete Logos and be sure to follow him, of course, on social media. And remember to keep an eye on his and SNY's social media for a chance to win one of those shirts. And a reminder, you're listening to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your shows. All right, Joe. Let's get into the week that was not a lot of winning going on for the Mets right now. I think the conversation, <laughs> if you're not watching on YouTube, Joe gives the both thumbs up when I say not a lot of winning for the Mets right now as they inch closer to one of those top six picks. Not there yet, Joe. So I think we start with that and then we'll look at a bigger picture topic. I mean, the Jets right now, the, the Jets, that's where I'm at. The Mets right now, pre-lottery, Joe, are really, really, really close. 
I mean, how do you see this thing shaking out with the way the schedule looks right now? I mean, I just I hate to say it this way because I hate to make it seem like I'm rooting against the Mets. But this is we're, this is for the Mets good, they, by the yeah, way. These these are largely ir, ir, immaterial. Is the word I'm looking for immaterial wins. The last six games that I promise you, if the Mets were to rally off six in a row to end the season, you ain't gonna remember that that happened. You're just gonna remember it was a bad season. Where were until, you until? Until the 2024 draft, when you're tweeting me saying, "Well, why didn't why didn't the Mets lose games at the end of last year?" It stinks that they're picking 19 instead of top six or top five. So, you know, I want Kodai Senga to throw a gem. Go ahead and throw six innings, strike out ten, maybe give up a run, and then you know, if one of the relievers who may or may not be here in 2024 wants to give up the lead in the eighth inning, like that doesn't that doesn't hurt me, uh, but. Connor, like you said, the Mets are where we stand as of recording right now on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, they're a game and a half out of the uh, a top six slot in the lottery. And where they stand right now, they have about a 35% chance of landing a lottery pick, which is a top six pick, uh, which would be protected. And just for background, we've talked about this on the show, but if you haven't listened to those episodes uh because the Mets spent north of $40 million over the luxury tax this year, if their selection is not within the top six after the lottery, their first pick will drop 10 slots and accompany that with the loss of bonus pool, which could be, you know, 2 million bucks, which means is the difference between adding another first round type of talent, just talking purely bonus money. Uh, so obviously a huge week for that and you know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes and don't care but uh for the betterment of the organization it would be ideal if they put themselves in the optimal position to have the lottery balls fall their way and who knows like they they could end up with the number one pick like that's uh certainly within the realm of possibility but i would like it if if they could find their way to that six spot i know the angels have a couple more games with the rangers and then they have a weekend series with oakland to close the year so Go ahead and beat up Oakland and Mets. Go ahead and lose a few games. And if you could get into the sixth spot, that'll put their odds north of 40% to land the lottery pick. And that's as close to a 50-50 shot as you could get. And I would like to take our chances with that. I think the point you bring up about the slot money is the one a lot of people are overlooking, right? Yeah. Having a higher pick is awesome in baseball. And, you know, obviously there's blue chip talent at the top of most MLB drafts, but like you said, Joe, there's also the game of the MLB draft, which is the slot money, which gives you more flexibility to kind of maneuver differently through the draft in a draft where you still can't trade picks. But that's the maneuverability. So I'm with you all the way there. I said we were going to get into a bigger picture conversation, and I think it's time. Surprisingly, you and I have not had this conversation because there's been so much going on with the Mets, even when they're not in a playoff race. It's the hiring of David Stearns, the young players. Obviously, the draft conversation we cover feels like the entire minor league system, but a lot of Binghamton on this show as well, because that's where a lot of the minor league talent is right now. And we have not discussed the future of Buck Showalter with this team. And the Mets are going into a year that no matter what you believe, Joe, right, a transition year, a, a step back and retool year, or maybe they're competing like they always have under Steve Cohen. We don't really know until we see the moves that are made. And I think ultimately it's going to land somewhere in the middle of what we're used to seeing where they might not go out and spend hundreds of millions of dollars, but they might go out and solve significant needs and maybe some young players next year step up and they're a very competitive team. That's that's where I land on this. Who's guiding them during that year is a really important question right now. And I think if you had this, you know, it's a little surprising we're here because it felt like Buck kind of signed on and you felt pretty good that, Hey, you know, for probably three years, Buck's going to try to take a veteran roster to the promised land. And the trade deadline shocked us all in a way where a lot of those veteran members of that veteran roster were moved for young players. The Mets next year, Joe, are going into a transition. It doesn't mean they're going to be a loser. It doesn't mean they're not going to be contending, but the roster is going to be much younger that's on the field every day. I guess I'll frame it to you like this. You could answer it whatever way you want, whether you do you want Buck Walter being the guy for that? And do you think Buck Walter will be the guy for that? So I'll take, I guess, both. Do I want Buck? I mean, 
I, I will say that when they hired Buck Walter, that wasn't mine or your preferred candidate. Uh, I, I look at it from a bit of a different lens. But at the same time, you know, Buck had a fantastic 2022. And 2020, and like that changed my mind a little bit on him. It was just like maybe I was off base. Uh, in 2023, of course, some blame goes on him. It's it's how this works. Blame goes on the front office. Blame largely goes on the players. Uh, the one thing that gives me a little pause, and you know, it could be something that maybe it was mutual between him and the front office. I don't know exactly how him and Billy Epler worked on this, but the inconsistency in which he was playing young players this year. I think is something that gives me a lot of pause as we head into 2024 where call it whatever we want to call it. Like they're just not trying, they're not going to set a preseason expectation of being a hundred win team. Uh, they want to focus on playing Ronnie Mauricio, uh, playing Francisco Alvarez, playing Brett Beatty, get, you know, Luis on Helicuna is going to be coming through. Drew Gilbert's going to be coming through. Jet Williams said his goal is to be there next year. Um, is Buck Showalter the right guy to lead the young players and play the young players? Because that's what it comes down to. Mark Vientos, another name that I forgot. Like Mark Vientos is now getting playing time, and voila, he, he looks like he could hit. Like it's it's crazy Funny how, how that things, works. It's crazy it could work that way sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, and some guys just never figure it out. And that that's part of the whole the whole object of getting as many high level talented prospects as you can because. As much as I talk about the good traits of all the players in the system, a percentage of them are just not going to pan out at the big league level. That is that is just simply how it works. Um, so I'm very on the fence if I want Buck back. But a big factor of it is who am I replacing him with? Because yeah. I don't want to just I don't want to just get rid of Buck for the sake of getting rid of Buck and just saying 2023 was bad. Just dump Buck Showalter. You know the reports are now that. Craig Council very much is planning on managing next year. David Stearns, he didn't exactly hire Craig Council. He inherited him. But clearly, there had to be a relationship of some form there. They were working together. So uh, if David if David Stearns wants to hire Craig Council, I completely understand. And also on the other side, because I, I, I think right now there's a lot of just like anti-Buck stuff. And I, we try to be fair here and, you know, does Buck Showalter want to manage that team? Like that's Fair. a question for him. That's a question for him as well. Like obviously he's an older guy. He knows that his time managing at the big league level is at or near the end. Like I, I don't think he's going to be managing another team after his Mets tenure ends um, at, at the major league level. So does he want his last year to be one of those transitional years where it's all right, we're trying to win. 85 games on paper and then obviously you hope things go better and then you address it at the deadline so i don't know if buck even would want that job but uh a very long long way of saying i could give or take like if buck wants to stay and and david stearns wants to evaluate everything for a year i completely understand that but if craig council becomes available and wants to come to the mets um because there's also some speculation he wouldn't want to leave the midwest uh, I, I would certainly, I think Craig Council fits a bit more of the, what David Stearns and, you know, maybe what I'm envisioning for a manager long-term. Yeah. I mean, you nailed it. I think that there, there is a lot at stake here. And I, you know, I had to look up Vientos stats month by month. And of course he's had his most plate appearances in the month of September. He's at 74 and it's no coincidence that his OPS is right around 800 in that month. And I'm not saying yeah, those is the answer because I know he had a tough August, but I think there was a lot of warranted frustration about young guys not playing or maybe it, the thing is, it felt like, OK, my big thing here is it felt like there's some kind of disconnect between the organization and the big league product in terms of how it's being managed. You have a young guy come up and maybe you don't want to thrust big expectations on him. But playing him every few days in the in the eighth or ninth hole is also doing him a disservice. That's not helping him by just keeping him out of the spotlight because then he's never settling in. He's not batting in a spot in the order that makes any sense for him. And quite frankly, he's not playing like he was every day where he can get a feel for big league pitching. You're going up there and you're basically guessing every time from what you're not watching um, from the dugout. So and a, a older manager like Buck, I respect this aspect. It's not what I agree with, but I respect it. 
he's going to defer to veterans all the time, even guys that aren't established veterans, but have been hung, hanging around the big leagues or bouncing around the minors in the big leagues for the better part of a half decade or a decade, whatever it may be, rather than guys have, that haven't had that cup of coffee. And I don't think that aligns with the Mets right now. I don't. It's nothing personal. It's not like you said, Joe, when Buck's name was first thrown out to be interviewed by the Mets in the favorite, you and I were like, eh, not ideal. We want younger. We're thinking a different start to this era. They go with Buck. I'm sure Max Scherzer and a lot of veteran players had a big influence on that as well. We ate our words that first year. We were like, he's been great. He's been the right guiding force. He understands, um, you know, the strategic advantages and there's a quiet leadership there that makes sense. And quite frankly, year two, the rug completely was pulled out and the wheels fell off the bus and everything that could go wrong went wrong. And now we enter a period where however you feel about those last two years, if you stand on the side that 2022 was a more accurate depiction of what they are under Buck or 2023 was, the fact is 2024 is nothing like those years anymore. It's nothing like those years. They are a young team. They need to be a young team. And they need a change in the roster and energy. And a lot of that is going to be guided by the young players that they surround uh, around the core players. And I think it's time to go in a different direction. I know it's a long winded way of saying it, but I don't think it's anything personal against Buck Showalter. I think it's just time. No, it, it's obviously not personal. Like I would have preferred that the Mets won 110 games and we were right not now having the combo. How, yeah. I'd rather ha them have clinched the National League East or, or something like I, I don't want to be here, uh, but it's where we are. And it's it's going to be really interesting to hear from David Stearns, um, obviously, as Andy Martino of SNY reported, he can officially become a Mets employee on October 2nd. Um, I'm hoping that means like a press conference is like October 3rd. I don't know. But like within a couple days, we could hear from David Stearns. And I'm, I'm interested to hear what his mindset is. Um, and at some point, I'm sure Buck is going to want to say something, too. I know it's uh, like if he doesn't want to manage his team, I would completely understand. Like if I were if I were in his shoes, do I want to go through a whole nother year of this where the expectations aren't to win the whole thing? Because that was one of the big draws, I think, that brought Buck to this job is Steve Cohen and ownership and the front office were like, we are all in right now right here to try to win a world series and you make sense as the the guy to bring us there um and it, it didn't work out that is what it is that's kind of the luck of the playoffs it's how it works uh but I, i'd be very interested in the next week or two what you know over over the next couple of weeks what does david stearns think about this and uh what does buck showalter think about this yeah that's it's something we'll we'll have every step of it covered and we'll see where it goes from there. And obviously, if the Mets do make a change, we'll, as this will be the second time in our podcasting history, Joe, kind of crazy, we will be covering candidates and who we like and who we're intrigued by and who the Mets are intrigued by. And a big job of whether it's Buck or those candidates is a lot of the guys that are playing in the Binghamton playoffs right now, Joe. So to recap game one, uh, as we sit here and record and look down on the farm, Binghamton is down one game, one game to zero in the Eastern League Championship Series. But game one had a lot of offense. It had a lot of fun from the big names in the Mets system. Three hits from Kevin Parada. Four walks from Jet Williams. Not four walks for the team. Four walks for Jet Williams. Jet doing what he does. And, of course, two hits as well, um, including a monster three-run homer for Drew Gilbert. So Parada, three hits. Jet Williams, four walks. Drew Gilbert, two hits and a three run homer that actually tied the game and made it six, six at that moment. I mean, Joe, just what do you, what do you think of this trio and beyond of all the talent that's just kind of oozing down there at Binghamton? Well, f a fun fact about game one. So they're facing the Erie Seawolves, which is the double A affiliate of the Detroit Tigers and the starting pitcher uh, for Erie in game one. And he didn't fare so well and got bounced out pretty early is the younger brother of former Met Wilmer Flores, and his name is Wilmer Flores. So uh, there's there's a multiple Wilmer Flores is out there. So it was cool to see that little connection. But when you look at, I mean, the Mets guys, like you look up and down that Binghamton lineup and relative to prospect status, uh, th there's very few lineups in the minor leagues that stand up to this. I mean, you didn't even mention Luis Adel Acuna. Right. So uh, you're talking about 
you know, top 100, four top 100 guys. Or Kevin Pryor is a board, considered borderline by some, but uh, certainly Acuna, Gilbert, Jet Williams are top 100 prospects, and I think Parada is too. Uh, so there's not there's not many holes in that lineup, and they hit, just didn't pitch in game one. Blade Tidwell was good early, fell apart in the middle, and then some of the relievers that have been pretty reliable for Binghamton uh, didn't fare so well. But two games left um, as we record here on Tuesday. If you listen Tuesday night, their season might be over. If you listen Wednesday morning, uh, there might be one game left. But it's exciting to think for the Mets, like you said, Connor, when we were talking about Buck and, and that situation, uh, the Mets' focus is going to be on young players over the next couple of years. And when you look at guys like Parada and Jet Williams, I suspect will start next year at Double A. Uh, Luis Angel Acuna and Drew Gilbert, I would suspect, would start in Triple A in 24. So you're talking about a group of four guys that are in the upper minors. And then that doesn't even get into the pitching, which there's plenty of pitchers that are going to be the upper minors. So a system that is drastically improving is not just improving in talent where we're like three years from now, you wait and see what so-and-so looks like. Like this is within a year, within two years, uh, you're going to see some of these guys come up and impact the big league team. And it's going to be interesting to see how the Mets uh, navigate this positionally with some of these players with, Obviously, Jet Williams and Luis Anel Cunha being middle infielders. Uh, Drew Gilbert can play all outfield spots, but he's most comfortable in center. Uh, so it, it'll be very interesting to see how they navigate those guys. But I tweeted it last night, and I stand by it, and it goes back to his time at Tennessee. Drew Gilbert just has that that gene that you're looking for. Like big if, there is a, if there's a big moment um, – you want Drew Gilbert to be at the plate. So down three in the sixth inning, two guys on, uh, Drew Gilbert just cranked a homer. So uh, really, really love to see what's happening. Kevin Parada is turning it around offensively too. Some guys just embrace that moment much differently than others. And we've seen that from Gilbert at the college level. We've now seen it from Gilbert um, in a, you know, a higher level of minor league baseball. And I think we're all looking forward to seeing it at City Field. All right, let's recap our scoreboard prediction, sadly, from last week. We'll get some more, and of course, we'll answer your mailbag questions. Last week, the over-under push was set at two for Pete Alonso home runs in the next six games. You went with a push, Joe. I went with the over. No home runs for Pete, Joe. Not a good week for Pete Alonso as he tries to finish out the season on a higher note this week. Over-under push set at six for Jeff McNeil. Hits in the next six games. Joe, you pushed. I went under. No points for any of us. McNeil stays hot. Nine hits on the week for McNeil, who has really pushed that batting average up after a miserable first half to his season. Over-under push was set at seven for Kodai Senga's strikeouts in his next start. I went with a push. Joe, you went over. Senga only struck out three. So a, a rare low strikeout night for Senga, although he um, his second half has been marvelous for this Mets team. The over-under push was set at one for Mark Vientos' home runs in the next six games. Joe, we both went with a push. He hit three. Big week for Vientos. We've seen the power start to come alive to the big leagues. I, it, we'll have a bigger conversation on this in the offseason. I'm excited for Mark Vientos to go have another big offseason, get into spring training, and hopefully kind of grab momentum from there to be a DH for this team next year. We'll see what he could do. Over-under push was set at two for Ronnie Mauricio steals in the next six. You went with a push, Joe. I went over. Ronnie didn't steal any bases this week. Over under push was we did really bad this week, by the we way. Stink. If you can't tell, we're Jeez. awful at this. Over under push was set at one for Alvarez, Francisco Alvarez home runs. Uh, you went with the push, I went with the over. Alvarez didn't hit any home runs, he's had a really, really tough two months here. And so, have Joe and I, mostly me, but so is Joe. Over under push was set at one for DJ Stewart home runs in the next six games. Joe, you went under, smart man. You get the point. I went push, I'm not a smart man in this contest, I get no points. Over-under push was set at two for Luis Guillorme hits in the next six games. We both went under. We both got a point. Luis Guillorme did not have a hit in any of those six games. So, Joe wins the week two to one. Joe is winning the season 27 to 20. It's the last week. I, and this is, this is clearly written by our producer, Jeff. Written quite well. I get one more desperate Hail Mary like Zach Wilson at the end of the Jets-Patriots game. Just maybe, maybe I can catch the deflection that Randall Cobb could. Phenomenal. Here we go, Joe. Buckle up. Over-under push set at two for Pete Alonzo home runs in the last, last, not next, last six games. What do you got? 
It's a little sad that it says last six games. Yeah, but that's here we are. Another we season are. in the books for the yeah. Mets pod. Yeah, so I'll push, and I think I think he's at 45, right? Yeah. Is he at 45 right now? Yeah, because I predicted on Mets Off Day Live he hit 47, so I'll push and say I was right about that. There you go. Got to get something. I'll go over here. I need to make up points. I'm not going to agree with you as much as I can. Um, I think Pete is going to swing for the fences to have every chance at 50. I don't think he gets there, but I think Pete will treat it like that kind of week. How far How do I have a shot at 50 home runs? Over under push is at seven. Jeff McNeil hits in the last six games. Man, he had nine last week. I'm going to go under here, Joe. Seven's a high number. I know Jeff can do it, but I'm going to go under. I'll push. I think Jeff McNeil is just going to finish the season hot, and uh, I might even be undershooting. Over under push at seven for Senga strikeouts in his last start, Joe. Man, uh, really low strikeout total last time. Odd. Yeah, which is which is odd for him based on how he's pitched. This is a real tough one. I, I think I'll push again. I think I pushed last week at seven. I'll do the same. I think he's going to he'll bounce back, but it's not necessarily going to be one of those uh, 12 strikeout games that he's had. I'm going to go over for Senga. Look at his last five starts. His last star, only three. Start before that, 10. Start before that, five. Start before that, 12. And before that, 10. So three of his last five starts, he's gotten double-digit strikeouts. So I think you basically are looking at Senga's either got it working and nobody's touching his stuff, or he's pitching to contact a little bit more. And here's the funny thing, Joe. He hasn't had a bad start in the last five. Both strategies work for Senga right now. So you, you'd love to see him have some... Uh, versatility in the way that he's pitching. I will go over seven strikeouts for Senga. Over under push at one for Vientos home runs in the last six games. I'm going to go with a push here, Joe. I think Vientos finishes with just one home run in the final week of the season. I'm going to join you. I think he's got one more in him, and, and I think that'll be that. All right. The next one, one oh, it's set at one for Ronnie Mauricio home runs in the last six games. What do you got here, Joe? I will go under and i don't really have a good reason why i just think he just won't hit a home run this week i don't know because he you know what? ronnie mauricio is in on the tank so he's not going to hit a home run this week i'll go with a push for ronnie ronnie gets one this week all right the next one brett Beatty hits in the last six games is set at three i'm gonna go under joe where are you going i am going to go over and maybe it's not the best idea but I, i've liked a couple of the hard hit balls that Beatty has done i know his stats have not looked good and have certainly brought a lot of questions to brett Beatty in 2024 uh but you know maybe he'll finish hot all right the over under push is set at one for brandon nimmo home runs in the last six games what do you got here joe under Brandon Nimmo has already publicly said he doesn't mind if the Mets finish in last place. So he's in on it. So no home runs for Brandon Nimmo last six games. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. I'll push here. I think he gets one, which would give him 25 home runs on the season. Nimmo's previous career high was 17 in 2018. He's hit 24 this year. Um, a great season for Nimmo in terms of the power numbers. A really, really great season for Nimmo. His OBP. It's gone from the days of being at 400, but it's still at a, a solid 361. But 25 home runs. If you, Joe, if you, and by the way, just to clarify, I'm taking the push for Nimmo. If you told someone, it, say it was me, say it was me telling you before the season, Kodai Senga is going to finish in the top three to five in the Cy Young voting. Brandon Nimmo is going to hit a career high 25 home runs. Francisco Alvarez is going to hit over 20 home runs. And mm, Lindor might go 30 30. Lindor is going to 45. Lindor is going to tiptoe the line at being a 30 30 player for the first time in his career. And Pete Alonso is going to come just a hair away from 50 home runs. You would say the New York Mets finished in what place? Uh, second behind Atlanta, but winning 90, <laughs> 96 or 97 games, uh, something like that. But uh, oh, here we are. we are furious. All right, Francisco yeah. Alvarez home runs in the next six games is set at one. Oh, man, I'm going to push here as well. I think one for Alvarez. I feel like I should go under here. I, I think Francisco is a little um, maybe a little burned out. It's a longer season. You know, he's played a lot. I think that. He's got to make adjustments. We have full faith he's going to be a superstar. I don't expect some wild finish here, but I think he gets one. 
Yeah, I feel good about Francisco Alvarez going forward, but I'm going to go under. I know he had the little finger thing. He had the ball fouled off. It mm, seems like point. he's going to be okay, uh, but I I'll take the under that you refuse to take. All right. Over, under, push. You said at one, Joe, for Francisco Lindor steals in the next six games. Uh, So he, he got 30 on steals, right? He's at Is 30 right, right now. 27 home runs, 30 steals. Uh push like maybe he'll get 31 but he, if he was going to try to get 30 like if he was at 28 i would have gone over yeah i'm gonna go with under here i don't think lindor steals a base this week he got to 30 good for lindor great season last one will starling Marte play one of his last one of the last six games yes or no i will say no what are you saying joe i think i'm also gonna say no and I'll be honest, I, I don't see much of a reason why, as to why they should. Uh, so I'm going to say no and join you there. I'm with you. All, all right. So those are our final scoreboard predictions of the year. Let us know on Twitter, the, the comments on YouTube, if you like the scoreboard predictions this year. I think it's a it's a fun way for Joe and I to not only compete, but also it's kind of a preview of the week ahead of who's hot, who could stay hot. Who needs to break out? Who's slumping? We did it with the minor league system too, which was a lot of fun. So hopefully it's something that we could build on. All right, let's get into the mailbag questions to close out the show. Joe, this first one is a very Mets pod branded question from William J. Mazza. What does a contract for Yamamoto look like? A lot the price of money goes up lot. every yeah. day. Yesterday's yeah. price oh. ain't today's price. A lot of money in a lot of years. Uh, like, I, I, I believe I saw a report when you talk about the Yankees that they expected to um, offer him a deal north of Masahiro Tanaka's seven years at $155 million that he signed for back whenever the Yankees signed him. Uh, so I think this is a contract that's seven years of length probably, maybe eight. Uh, maybe there's an opt-out in there somewhere depending on how he pitches. Uh, but a 25-year-old arm, that – it's a contract that's going to approach $200 million probably. Uh, I, I don't think there's going to be a ton of teams truly involved because how many teams are willing to take a risk at that volume. Uh, but I think it's going to be very aggressive, big market teams pursuing. Uh, and, you know, I, I certainly believe the Mets are going to be among the most aggressive, if not the most aggressive in pursuit of Yamamoto. Uh, it certainly doesn't guarantee that they're going to land him. Uh, but I would peg the contract in the seven to eight years with an opt out somewhere in it and in the neighborhood of two hundred million dollars. Maybe that's 180, maybe that's 185, but somewhere in the vicinity of 200 million. I think so, too. I, here's another layer, Joe. Otani's not pitching next year. So if you were a team that thought, hey, I'm going to put at the front of my rotation Shohei Otani. Those days are over. He might be at the front of your rotation yeah. two years from now, and even that's a big uphill battle. So Yamamoto, it's a deep pitching class. There's a lot of good pitchers in it. Blake yeah. Snell's going to get paid. Like Those guys are going to get paid. Jordan Montgomery, Aaron Nola, they're all going to get paid. But Yamamoto becomes that much more intriguing with Otani not pitching next year. Who, I'll close it on this. Who who do you say? Give me five teams you think are in, if there are five. We, were assume, we know the, yeah. the Mets are in. We know the Mets are yeah. in. And we know the Yankees are in, yeah. which this yeah, pretty, these Yankees is kind of weird, but yeah. okay. It's it's going to be potentially the first time since Steve Cohen bought the Mets that the Mets and Yankees will have a genuine like competition for the same free agent. So not it'll be interesting. To see. <laughs> no, not not at this point. And they need some they need some offense in the Bronx too. We're not going to make it the Yankees pod here, but uh, they need some offense. They need to worry spending maybe a little less on pitching, but some other teams. Uh, the Dodgers, I think, certainly have to be sure, considered if, if they're not able if they're not able to land Otani. Uh, I think I think they are one of the teams that valued the two way that Otani provided uh, in a big way. So I think the Dodgers are in play. Um, there's been word that Arizona Diamondbacks are a team that's going to be sneaky involved Sleeper. here. Uh, the Boston Red Sox. That's who, the one. I think they're the realest one yeah. besides the Mets. They have a, and, a really good offense and they need young pitching. And the last team, I don't know if I named five, but if I named five or six, maybe San Francisco, I think is yeah. another team. I think they're a team that's missed out on so many free agents over the last couple of years. And I think there is some pressure on Farhan, Far, Farhan Zaidi over there to reel in a big fish this offseason. OK, this next one from uh, Mikey Chips, who said, 
I dropped this question to Connor last week, but I'll ask you, Joe, from a one to 10, what is your grade on how the Mets handled, accessed, managed the kids this year? I'm at a three. One example is how they underestimated Alvarez's defense, which is something we heard was holding him back. He was fine. Mm -hmm. So I really think it's hard to put like a one to 10 on every, on like just blanket them. Yeah. Because because I think they handled each one kind of differently. Like Alvarez, at the beginning, he was treated kind of like Tomas Nito's backup. And then he started to hit. And then Francisco Alvarez was playing nearly every single day. Uh, so I thought they it was a little peculiar at the beginning, but largely they handled Alvarez, I think, fine. Uh, Brett Beatty almost got too much leash. They were playing him every single day when he was hitting, yeah. you know, one, 140. So like that, they had almost too much leash there. Uh, they they wouldn't give Vientos a shot until recently. So, um, and Mauricio's played since he's come up in the short spurts. So, like, I don't know, like, I hate to kind of live down the middle, but like a five, like there was some good and some bad in different ways. So it's hard to blanket it, but uh, certainly I hope in 2024, uh, the Mets have a more well laid out plan for the use of their young players. I would have given it a five as well. Um I think you nailed it that each case is different. I think that holding back Alvarez was, you know, obviously a mistake. They needed Alvarez's power in the beginning of the year. And, and one thing I want to add yeah. on that, when you talk about the defense, that's something that I want them to self-evaluate because Ronnie right. Mauricio apparently couldn't play second base and he looks fine per at second perfect. base. Alvarez, yeah. So like th these are situations where are they handling them like, because I understand there's a difference between an aggressive and a passive player development approach and doesn't make either side correct because sometimes aggressive doesn't work out. Sometimes passive doesn't work out. But I wonder if they are handling just slightly too much with kids gloves on defense. I mean, they're professional ball players. Like, uh, does do they just kick every ball that comes at them? Like, they're, they're out there as pros. So uh, I do wonder, and maybe that's a part of the self-evaluation that David Stearns and whoever takes over player development um, with Kevin Howard departing, whoever takes over that role, hopefully that's a good self-evaluation tool that they can take. Yeah, bringing up Ronnie lowers my grade to a four. I think they botched Ronnie. I know that yeah. wh whether it's service time, I don't know. Either way, it feels like they, Ronnie's development as a whole is something I have my eyes on right now. We know he's not going to be a shortstop. Even if Lindor wasn't here, I don't think Ronnie's right. a shortstop. But Ronnie looks like a really good third baseman to me. And I, I yeah. think that, or at least highly capable, which the Mets have not had at third, it felt like, for quite some time now. So, yeah, it was a tough year for the way the Mets handled um, their young players in the system. And hopefully the Stearns era kind of kicks off by taking that a step in the right direction because you're going to go through this with Drew, Drew Gilbert in the outfield. You're going to go through it with Luis Angel Acuna most likely in the infield. You're going to go through it with a lot of different young depth arms when they need to be called upon when their four or five pitcher gets hurt or something next year, whoever it may be. That, like this was a trial this year and it, it didn't, it was uneven. These next two years, Joe, it's massive because, yeah, I mean, what, like, oh, what would you set the over under at Mets prospects that make their debut over the next, I'll say year? It would probably be more fun if I said two years, but next year. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be a few. Like I, I suspect Vassal we'll see Luis Acuna at some point. You'll see Vassal, uh, Gilbert. Tom Hamill, Christian Scott, Gilbert, Jet Williams potentially. Like it wouldn't he, shock us. He, yeah, it, it would probably be like six all. and a half would be the over under. Yeah, yeah. which is it's a good crazy. Yeah. It's crazy, and, and they're, not, they're not. Yeah, relievers too. They could be relievers yeah. too that are kind of prospects like Paul Gervais and yeah. Nate Lavender. But like, yeah, no, there, there's a lot coming, and. uh you just got to be ready for it. Yeah. I think the fair way to set that number is they have to be in your top 30 in the system. Otherwise okay, it just gets fair. out of, it gets a yeah, little out of control. Yeah, that's so, fair. That's all right. Fair. That's it for us. This is the Mets pod presented by tri-state Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to boulder in an SUV from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your tri-state Cadillac dealer today. And of course, remember to subscribe to the show at Apple podcast, Spotify, you can watch on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcast. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.